sure we welcome Brother Jordan, Sister Edna with us tonight. And we've reached the 18th chapter of the Apocalypse, and we finished up last time in verse 5, having considered the plea in verse 4, to come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And we considered the implications of that, particularly to the nation of Israel, but more also to the nations of the world, in order to forsake the uh, thoughts of Babylon and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to commence tonight in verse 5, where we read, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, I don't think there's any doubt that the heaven being referred to in verse 5 is the same which we have seen throughout the political heaven, the one mentioned in verse 1, where we saw the mighty angel coming down from heaven. And at this point in time, the Lord Jesus Christ has been established in Jerusalem, and it is from there that the declaration went to all the nations of the world to fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of her judgment is come. And I believe it's in response to that that we have verse 5 because the Roman Catholic Church, described here as the harlot system under the banner of Babylon the Great, will reject the invitation to fear God and give glory unto him. She will not accept the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we know and as we have considered before, one of the tenets of their faith is that there will arrive in Jerusalem an antichrist, and therefore they, under that banner, will resist any commandment which he will issue forth, saying that he is just an imposter, that he is not the true Son of God, that he is someone who they have labelled Antichrist. And her sins have reached unto heaven, <clears throat> and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, if we can go back to chapter 16. Remember when we were considering the work particularly of Napoleon, under the vile periods of the 16th chapter, when he waged war very particularly upon the Catholic system. We find in verse 10, under the fifth vial, that the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now the vile period was probably the greatest uh, resistance to the Catholic system that they had experienced since the days of its inception. Through Napoleon and his armies, there was terrible persecution of the Catholic system, which led, as verse 10 and 11 indicate, to the loss of the temporal power, and Rome and the Catholic Church was given just one square mile, which became known as the Vatican City. And therefore, she was very much isolated within Europe and lost most of her power and authority. And yet, with all this persecution, they did not surrender their allegiance to the God of heaven. But on the contrary, as we saw in verse 11, all these terrible things which came upon them, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of it because of their pains and their sores, and you'll notice, and they repented not of their deeds. Now if you think about the principle God has used throughout the history of time, for instance if we take the book of Judges, when Israel committed sin and wickedness against the Most High, God would raise up a nation who would come into the land and punish them, and so on and so forth. And they would then cry unto their God, and he would raise up a deliverer and send a judge to deliver them from their enemy. In other words, they appreciated and understood that the punishment of the surrounding nations were coming upon them because of their sin and iniquity before God. And this carries on right the way through. And many, many times, God raises up nations and peoples to punish his people to try and correct them and to turn them from their evil ways. And in the majority of cases, for a time at least, 
Israel repented of their evil deeds. Now here, we find that although the persecution of Napoleon stemming from the French Revolution came upon the Catholic system, they repented not of their deeds. Even though they lost all their power, even though they were persecuted and isolated within Europe, which obviously had been their stronghold, they still didn't repent of their deeds. Now again, if you come to the 17th chapter, when in verse 16 and 17, we saw in the description of the harlot system a reference back to that French Revolution and its aftermath. Verse 16, The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And even then, and here we've got the vile period being described in verses 16 and 17, the Roman Catholic Church did not repent of his evil deeds. Now, when we come therefore to the 18th chapter, even though they have seen the power of Almighty God vested in the Lord Jesus Christ, destroy the Gogan Confederacy and don't forget church and state have become aligned according to the image of Daniel 2 and according to the beast of Daniel chapter 8 we find a united force against the Lord Jesus Christ first military and then religious and even though she has seen her ally the Russian Confederacy destroyed upon the mountains of Israel and even though she has heard the declaration emanating from Jerusalem, taken by the saints throughout all the earth, to fear God and give glory to him. She still has refused to submit. And therefore, in chapter 18 and verse 5, her sins, her transgressions before God, have reached unto this political heaven, unto the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in Jerusalem, and God hath remembered her iniquities. God hath remembered her iniquities. Now we've seen those iniquities in the 17th chapter. We can see them highlighted for us in the 24th verse of this 18th chapter. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's God's description of the iniquities of this system. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. And throughout our study from the sixth chapter onwards, we have seen the terrible persecution meted out by the Catholic Church, both upon the saints of the Most High God and upon the nations of this world. And we saw particularly in the eleventh chapter with the two witnesses and the great destruction culminating in the battle of St. Bartholomew, God hath not forgotten these things. God hath remembered her iniquities. And although God is not willing that any should perish, but all should turn to him and live, even when, as under the French Revolution and afterwards, he brought persecution upon her, by chance she might repent of her deeds, she refused. The decree went forth from Jerusalem Fear God and give glory to him when the Lord Jesus Christ is there in Jerusalem and still she has refused. And therefore her sins have reached unto him and he hath remembered her iniquities. And therefore he meets out the punishment of verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her according to her works in the cup which he hath filled fill to a double. Now, I believe it's very heart-searching, brethren and sisters, and very exhortational in the way that verse 6 has been presented before us in the scriptures of truth. We all understand and appreciate the reason why the wrath of God is going to be meted out upon this Babylon the Great. 
but it's the very terms of that wrath which is very significant, I believe, not only to them, but as far as we are concerned. Reward her even as she hath rewarded you. Remember under the law, the eye for the eye, the tooth for the tooth principle, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And therefore God hath remembered her iniquities. And God will therefore, through the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, meet out the judgments that are written. Now, it's significant that it's going to be double unto her according to her works. Because if you go back into the book of Exodus, one of the laws in Exodus chapter 22 states the precise reason when something had to be restored double. It's in Exodus chapter 22 and in verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he hath nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. And again in verse 7, if a man shall deliver unto his neighbour money or stuff to keep, and he be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand unto his neighbour's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for an ox, an ass, sheep, raiment, or for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbour. So a thief had to restore twofold, double unto the victim. Now, just think about that in the context of Apocalypse 18 and verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Double unto her, double unto her, double according to her works. There was to be a twofold vengeance upon this harlot system, as if she had got to double pay for iniquities, which seems, in my opinion, to link it with the aspect of the thief having to pay double for his deeds. Now, if we follow this thought through, can I take you to the first of Timothy and chapter 2? Now, we have seen, or hopefully we have seen, throughout the 17th chapter, what this Catholic system has done to cause God to speak in such terms concerning her. And the main problem is the very opposite of what we find in the first of Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. It is good and acceptable in the sight of our God who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That is the will of Almighty God, who would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, tragically, of course, not many have responded to the invitation. Many have had the truth clouded for them by the Roman Catholic Church. If we come back to the 17th chapter, And we remember verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
the nations have been duped by the Roman Catholic Church. They have been intoxicated by the wine of her doctrine, which is the very opposite of all men coming to the knowledge of the truth. And we have seen in the 24th, 23rd verse of the 18th chapter, the end of the verse, when it says, Thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorcerers were all nations deceived. And in the Greek, it's the word pharmakia, as we have said, the pharmacist. And what Rome has done has taken various of her doctrines, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, the doctrine of the supernatural devil, the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope, and all the other strange doctrines of Rome, they've mixed them all up together, and they have presented them to the people as a medicine which would cause them to have salvation. Of course, the very opposite is true. It's drugged them. It's caused them to be blinded from the truth as it is revealed in Christ Jesus. And it is that above everything where God is rewarding the iniquity of Rome upon her double. Because she has deceived all nations by these sorceries. And therefore it is very significant that what she has done is rob people of the opportunity of the knowledge of the truth. And yet it's the will of God that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And yet Rome has deliberately robbed the people the opportunity of that. And therefore she has been a thief as far as the truth is concerned. And therefore I believe it's appropriate from Exodus 22 that she is to be judged twofold according to her deeds. Now I believe this is very exhortational, brothers and sisters, as I suggested as far as we're concerned. Can I take you back to Malachi chapter 1? And here God, through the prophet Malachi, is obviously speaking unto his people, the nation of Israel. And in um, Malachi chapter 1, God says in verse 7, You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, The temple of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor, will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person? And we all understand the message of Malachi. Israel were doing anything but what they're supposed to be doing. They were bringing the second best, anything they thought was good enough for God. And of course, it wasn't. So when we turn over to the third chapter and verse 8, God now brings the point together by saying in Malachi 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You, have, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and so on and so forth. And Israel were accused before God of robbing him. And yet they were unaware, and they said, How have we robbed you? How have we stole from you? And he says, quite categorically, in tithes and offerings. They were bringing what they felt was acceptable to God, and it wasn't. They had stood on the foot of Mount Sinai and says, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. But they hadn't been. In everything they were doing, they were robbing God. And of course, the exhortation comes tumbling down to us tonight. Will a man or a woman rob God? And yet we can all round this table say, wherein have we robbed him? Well, we rob him in time. We rob him in effort. We rob him in the things that we do. And yet we have said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. We have said quite categorically, every one of us, that we are not here to please ourselves, we're here to please God. 
We have said quite categorically, we will follow the Lamb with us however he goes. We will walk in his footsteps. We will do everything that pleases him. Our meat and drink is to do our Father's will. And yet we don't. Not one of us, brothers and sisters, if we're absolutely honest with ourselves, do it. We might try. We might sometimes very miserably fail. Whatever we are doing, when it's not in accordance with the will of God, we are robbing him. We are taking from him what rightfully is his. Because we have said that we are a purchased people. We are a people who are serving our God in everything that we say, everything that we think and everything that we do. And tragically, we don't. Thanks be to God that he has provided for us a mediator who will make up, according to his mercy, our deficiencies. But the exhortation is, will a man rob God? Now, as far as the Catholic system is concerned, they have robbed God of everything, including his honour and glory. And they will receive the vengeance of God, because he says, I have remembered their iniquities. Vengeance is mine, saith God, I will repay. And therefore it is right and it is proper that God will double unto Babylon the great wrath which will pour about them because they, more than anyone, have thieved from him. They have duped the nations in causing them to err as far as the truth is concerned. But we've got to think of it from our point of view, brothers and sisters. God can Remember our iniquities. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it needs each one of us not just to glory in the destruction of Babylon the Great, because that will be horrific indeed, but it will be our honour to execute those judgments that are written, providing we haven't, to some degree, followed in their footsteps and robbed God of what is rightfully his, and that's us, in service to him. We have promised faithfully that we will do whatsoever he commands us. And therefore, we've got to be careful that in our evenings, in our thoughts, in our aspirations, in the things that we do to please ourselves, we're not robbing him of the time, the effort, and the commodity which rightfully is his as us, as a purchased people. Now, it's very significant as we come back to the 16th chapter of the prophet Jeremiah that God speaks of Israel in the same context as he speaks of Babylon the Great. Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 17 For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Look what he says. And first, I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Why? Because they have defiled my land, they have filled my inheritance with the carcass of their detestable and abominable things. And that's what Malachi 1 and Malachi 3 is talking about. They have robbed God in tithes and offerings. They thought they were okay. They were coming to the meeting, to quote the phrase. They were performing what they felt were their vows. And it was abhorrent in the sight of God because they were hypocrites. It was not true. It was not genuine. It was not honest. They were there turning up at the temple. They were offering the sacrifices. But what did he mean? Nothing at all. And therefore God would remember their iniquity and their sin double because they robbed from him and that is the greatest crime anyone could ever commit to rob from God and therefore it is very, signific very significant that what happened unto Israel would happen unto Babylon the Great we pray indeed brothers and sisters it won't happen unto us that God will blot out our transgression, that he will turn his back from our iniquity, that through the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we indeed may be forgiven for our sins. But of course the onus upon, is upon us to do everything that we possibly can to make sure we are not robbing from God. Just as we come back to the Apocalypse 18, it, it's significant if we come back to the first of Timothy in chapter 5. Whenever we have been talking about vengeance being meted out double because of the iniquity, in the first of Timothy and chapter 5, You will notice in verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. And this of course is the reverse, that those who rule well will be counted worthy of double honour. They won't re receive the wrath double according to their deeds, but on the contrary, they will receive double honour, especially those who labour in the word and in the doctrine. So we've got to make sure that we are following the correct path, the right way, and not in the ways of Israel and Babylon the Great. So we come back to verse 6, brothers and sisters, Apocalypse 18. Reward her as she has rewarded you. God hath remembered her iniquities, and God whose vengeance it is, will mete out the terrible destruction upon Babylon the Great. And in verse 7 he says, How much she hath glorified herself, notice the emphasis, glorified herself, not accounted by God worthy of any honour, but she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. And if you look at the end of verse 3, the word for delicacies and the word deliciously is exactly the same in the Greek. The end of verse 3, the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. And of course this is the way Babylon, Roman Catholic Church, has elevated herself down the centuries of time. So much torment and sorrow give her, and this is very significant, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. <coughs> she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Now, Again, if we go back just a bit to chapter 17 and we think again of verses 16 and 17. At this time, under the vile periods, Rome was very much isolated. She was very much a widow because she was forsaken of Europe, which had been her power base down the centuries of time. And under the vile periods, mainly through Napoleon and the rest, Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, was very much persecuted and isolated. But of course now, the reversal has taken place. Not only do we see it in the earth to die, when the Roman, the Roman pontiff is very much exalted in the eyes of the nation, he is the best thing since sliced bread as far as the nations are concerned because he's going around trying to get a world of peace. And of course at the end of the day he will join forces with the military power so that we have the standing erect of the image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. And therefore she will be joined with the nations of the earth once again and more particularly as far as the 17th and 18th chapter is concerned, supported by the beast system of Europe. The actual one part, the dragon, the military power, has been destroyed by now. But she su is supported and rides, in the language of the apocalypse, the Roman beast of Europe. And it will be the European nations, more particularly as we know today, the common market, as we saw when we looked at the 17th chapter, who will once again give their support 
under the Roman Catholic Church. Now that's been a total reversal as to what happened in the 19th century when Rome was persecuted by those same European powers, particularly the French with Napoleon. But now she sits quite confident that she is no longer a widow. She sits quite supreme as queen of all the nations because she feels that she has got totally their support. And therefore she can see no reason to worry. Therefore I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. She cannot believe that with the support that she now has, anything but victory will be accomplished. Now, again, I know we've seen it before, but let's just go back to the first of Thessalonians in chapter 5. Verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now Babylon has joined forces with the military as far as 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3 is concerned, in accordance with the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 8. We've seen that on many occasions. But then sudden destruction cometh upon them. And she sees initially the destruction of the Gogan Confederacy. And she still cannot believe that she is going to be destroyed. Why? Because she believes that the power which arrives in Jerusalem is Antichrist. And she still commands the support of the European beast. And therefore she sits confident upon the fact that with the European support she can overcome the power of Antichrist. And therefore she says, I can see no sorrow. And like Nero of old, she will be found fiddling while Rome burns. She can see no sorrow. And look what verse 8 of chapter 18 says. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Notice the implication. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. End of verse 5. God hath remembered her iniquities. Strong is the Lord God who judges her. Although the judgments will be meted out by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, it is God the Almighty himself who will judge her for her iniquities. In one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. Now again, if we can come back to the 51st chapter of the prophecy of Jeremiah we have tried to show already that what happened to Babylon of old is a type or is typical of what will happen of Babylon in the future and in Jeremiah chapter 51 and in verse 60 Jeremiah, Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon even all these words that are written against Babylon and Jeremiah said to Sarariah when thou comest to Babylon and shalt see and shalt read all these words then thou shalt say o Yahweh thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off that none shall remain in it neither man nor beast but that it shall be desolate for ever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates, and thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that it will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. 
knows the dramatic way Jeremiah was given this prophecy concerning Babylon. It would be like a stone being cast into the midst of the Euphrates and it would sink and never rise. Now how did it literally happen? Well we all know, Daniel chapter 5. This was the way that God was to bring his judgment upon Babylon. And we all know the events of Daniel chapter 5 when Belshazzar makes a great feast. And of course all the things of Daniel chapter 5 are very typical of the way Babylon in the future is going to be destroyed. But for brevity, let's just come over into verse 25 and get the understanding of the writing upon the wall. And thus is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel yufasin. This is the interpretation. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Yufasin, Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldean slain. Overnight, the city of Babylon was taken. We know the drying up of the Euphrates and the marching through the floodgates by Cyrus and the Persian army caused them to overthrow the city of Babylon. And that's exactly what we saw in the 16th chapter. It was necessary for the drying up of the river Euphrates in order that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And at that time we saw that they were a type of what Cyrus had been in the past. But the point which Daniel is making and the point which Jeremiah 51 is making in one night was Babylon overthrown. In one night was Babylon overthrown taken. Now by no means, if we look at the history books, does that mean that in one night the Medes and the Persians completely and utterly took everything of Babylon over. It took many months and years before finally Babylon was under the rulership of the Medes and Persians. There were many, many provinces and lands to, dis to, to conquer. But the point was that the city was taken over in one day. Now, it's very significant if we come back to the 18th chapter and verse 8. That her plagues come in one day. Death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. And there is no doubt in my mind that that day in verse 8 is the day of the Lord. The one mentioned throughout the prophets. The day of the Lord, this shall happen, and the day of the Lord, that shall happen, and the day of the Lord, other things shall happen. And that day, in my humble opinion, is the day of the 40 years. The day from the time that the Lord Jesus Christ overcomes the Gogan Confederacy in order to establish the Kingdom of God. And therefore the day, the 12 hour day as it is in the Old Testament scriptures, is representing that period of time. And therefore to be consistent, we must look at chapter 18 and verse 8 in that time. But nevertheless, I also believe, because of verse 9, that within that day, there is going to be a more immediate destruction upon the city of Rome. Because in verse 9, the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for one in one hour is thy judgment come. Now we shall come to verse 10 in a moment of time. But the point is, after the destruction of the city of Rome, after the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church, this harlot system, the kings of the earth, the beast system will bewail and lament her destruction. Now if we're right with our time periods and we've tried to be consistent throughout the study, 
all nations, before the kingdom can be established, have got to submit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. All the nations of the earth have got to submit themselves unto him. Now tragic, it's only when his judgments are in the earth the inhabitants will learn righteousness. And we have suggested on many occasions that it will be 30 years in order for the nations of this world to be completely bowing the knee unto Almighty God, sin totally restrained in order for the kingdom of God to be established. And we have said on many occasions that from the time the Lord Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem, we've got the 10-year preaching of the everlasting gospel, the 30 years war upon the nations, until at the end of that period, the kingdom of God, the millennium of a thousand years, will commence. During this period of time of 40 years, Israel has been brought back to their land and has been joined with Judah in the land. We've had the building of the temple. We've had the eradication of men's uh, evil which they have placed upon this earth with all the monstrosities of the cities and all the other things. The desert must blossom as the rose. There's going to be a handful of corn in the top of the mountain. All this is going to take place during this 40-year period in order for the kingdom of God to commence in all its glory and beauty. Now, if that is so, and I think there's so much scriptural evidence to prove that, there can be no doubt about it. Verse 9 has got to take place within that period. And yet the kings of the earth are still lamenting the destruction of great Babylon. And therefore, if they are going to feel the wrath of Almighty God during the 30 years, as we shall come on to see that they will, then there must be a more immediate destruction of the Catholic Church. Because if it was going to take the full 30 years for the judgment of God to come upon the Catholic Church, there wouldn't be any period of time left for the kings of the earth to bewail her. And therefore, what I believe the book of the Apocalypse is revealing to us, upon the type of Babylon of old, whereas the city was taken overnight, it took many more years for the Medes and Persians to completely conquer the kingdom of Babylon and to change the whole thinking of the people from the ways of Babylon to the ways of Medo-Persia. So I believe is what the Apocalypse is revealing concerning the future. The Catholic Church is going to be completely and utterly destroyed, as it were, overnight. But then, there will be need to be a 30-year period of getting rid of the thinking of Catholicism from the minds of people throughout the earth that the B system, the nations of Europe, will support her, have got to be subdued. They have got to likewise be judged. And all the churches and all the other abominations have got to be got rid of from this earth in order for every knee to bow to him and the kingdom of God to be established in righteousness. Now, we're going to come to the judgment of the beast a little later on in the study. But I believe that the way it is indicated to us that the kings of the earth lament the destruction of Babylon indicates there is going to be a sudden and complete destruction of Babylon as if a millstone was cast into the midst of the sea and Babylon sinks forever but the ripples of that destruction will carry on until the nations who are spoken of as the sea will become the sea of glass. The effect of the destruction of Rome will be felt throughout the earth until God's judgment is poured out upon them and the nations, in submitting themselves to him, become the sea of glass of Apocalypse chapter 15. I believe we shall substantiate that as we go through. Now, in verse 8, if you look at it again, brothers and sisters, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. And you'll notice in verse 9, the kings of the earth bewail her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. She shall be judged with fire, and they shall see the smoke of her burning. 
Now I believe apocalyptically we are being introduced to the destruction of Babylon in a way that another power was destroyed in the past. Can I take you back to chapter 11? Apocalypse chapter 11. Now, I don't need to go through the symbols again because I'm sure you've got it all worked out in your mind. But in verse 8, Apocalypse 11, their dead bodies, this is the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So one of the titles linked to the great city of Rome is that of Sodom. Now if you come back to the epistle of Jude, The Epistle of Jude, and again, as we know, the Apostle, uh, sorry, Jude is going through various nations and uh, peoples which have um, caused God to bring judgment upon them. He says in verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Sodom, destroyed by God, giving themselves over, notice, to fornication, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, I therefore will submit to you the coincidence that Babylon the Great is termed spiritually Sodom. That's in Apocalypse chapter 11 and in verse 8. If we come to the 17th chapter, <coughs> we've seen in verse 2 that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We've seen in the 18th chapter that the fire of the wrath of Almighty God is to come down upon her. And isn't it significant, therefore, that Sodom and Gomorrah, giving themselves over to fornication, suffered the, avengen, the, the vengeance of eternal fire. And we know what God did unto Sodom and Gomorrah. He rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed that city. Now where is it today? Well those who've been to the land know only too well where it is, but most of us have read Thompson's Land in the book, and we know where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are today, lying under the Dead Sea. And there they have been submerged forever, never to rise again. And that was the vengeance of Almighty God upon those cities. Now I believe the links are too strong to ignore. Babylon was to be destroyed like a great millstone being thrown into the midst of the Euphrates, never to rise and to be seen again. And therefore it would indicate with this link to Sodom, with the smoke of her burning, that she shall be utterly burned with fire in exactly the way that Sodom was in the past. I believe that Almighty God will rain down from heaven there's the fire and brimstone in order to destroy that great city. Now, I know some have suggested that this is going to happen by volcanic eruption. Now, I'm not sufficiently aware as to whether or not, as we look back upon the destruction of Sodom, whether there was some volcanic eruption, because obviously it could have occurred at that time. I believe what the scriptures are saying, that God rained down fire and brimstone upon Sodom and destroyed it. And in exactly the same manner, I'm suggesting to you, upon the basis of what I've said, that God will rain down fire and brimstone upon that mile square Vatican City and will destroy the Pope and will destroy the Catholic system as it will be there. And then the kings of the earth shall be bewail her destruction. So as the mountain was destroyed, Olivet, in order to bring about 
the destruction of the Gogan Confederacy. So the seven hills of Rome will likewise be destroyed as the city, the Vatican City, is plummeted into the, de into the abyss, into the depths of the earth, never to be seen again. And I believe that what we have is the kings of the earth lamenting her destruction. Now if we can come back to the 51st chapter of, um, the, sorry, the 50th chapter of Jeremiah. In verse 46, we'll go straight in because of time to the end of the chapter. Jeremiah 50 and verse 46, notice what it says. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and the cry is heard among the nations. At the destruction, at the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and the cry is heard among the nations. Now that's exactly what we've got in verse 9 of chapter 18. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and have lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. The repercussions, the vibrations of this destruction of this Babylon the Great will be felt amongst the nations of the earth and they shall bewail her destruction. Now, the kings of the earth, in the context of the chapter, are obviously those who have committed fornication with her, chapter 17 and verse 2, chapter 17 and verse 12, and chapter 18 and verse 3. And to put it in more a term which we are familiar with, they are the beast of chapter 16 and verse 13. It's the kings of the earth who are the beast upon which the harlot has ridden. And so with the destruction of Babylon, chapter 16 and verse 13 has now seen the destruction of the dragon, the destruction of the false prophet, and what still remains is the destruction of the beast. And that beast are the kings of the earth of verse 9 of chapter 18 who have committed fornication and will bewail her destruction. Now again, for those of you who like to tie it up, if you come back to the 14th chapter of the Apocalypse, in verse 8, after the declaration, verse 7, Fair God, give glory to him, which emanates from the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem after the destruction of, Gro of Gog. In verse 8, the destruction of Babylon. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then you'll notice in verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead and his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up for ever and ever and they have no rest nor day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And so notice in verse 9 after the destruction of Babylon another message is given to the kings of the earth, to those who have worshipped this evil system, to leave the worship, to leave all their previous way and come unto God. If not, the same shall drink of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation. And from verses 9 to 11, we've got the destruction upon the kings of the earth who do not forsake their old ways and re relinquish all previous ties to Babylon the Great. And therefore, their destruction 
the destruction of the beast is still to come. And so, are we, we got, oh, we've got five minutes, oh great, we can go on. So, verse 9, coming back to chapter 18 and verse 9. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication, the beast, the kings of the earth, the European system, when they shall see the smoke of them burning, shall lament, standing afar off, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more at all. And therefore there is this lamenting, there is this bewailing of this evil system. Now, can we take you back to the prophet Daniel? Can we come back to the seventh chapter? And again, I believe we've got in the seventh chapter of Daniel, under the symbology of the Ancient of Days, exactly the same picture that we've got being painted in the 18th chapter. In verse 8, we've got this little horn appearing from the Roman beast, which has eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And we know it's the papal horn. It's the one which was to come out of Rome, which became more powerful than the military and became the religious Roman Catholic Church. And Daniel chapter 7 goes on to speak about the destruction of this same system, as we've seen many times. But you notice, in verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the air of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now Daniel, obviously, is far more sketchy than the Apocalypse. It's given us an outline. It's like the skeleton, and the Apocalypse puts the flesh upon it. But Daniel sees this time in the future when the Ancient of Days the Lord Jesus Christ symbolically, with the saints, will bring the fiery judgments of God upon this world. And more particularly, he says in verse 11, I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld till the beast was slain. And the context of Daniel 7 verse 11 is obviously indicating this papal horn, this papal beast, as Daniel saw it. And he says, I beheld it till it was slain and given to the burning flame. And that's exactly the way the Apocalypse descri describes the destruction of Babylon. But you'll notice, as concerning the rest of the beasts. Now Daniel has seen four beasts. And he sees the destruction of the one, the Roman, the papal one. He now says that the rest of the beasts will have their power, their dominion, taken away. But their lives were prolonged for a season and a time, which obviously speaks of the thousand years. And Daniel sees the rest of the beasts as the nations, the kings of the earth, because obviously the three other beasts were representing the nations of the earth as they existed under Babylon, Medo-Persia, and, um, and Greece. And he sees them apocalyptically now in the future as the rest of the nations who are still alive after the destruction of the papal beast 
who will have their dominion taken away. The Apocalypse tells us that before that happens, these kings of the earth will lament the destruction of the papal system. But they, likewise, will be subject to the wrath of Almighty God until they submit to him. They have their dominion taken away. And therefore, in verse 14, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And that all nations and peoples and languages should serve him. And therefore, it's significant that what da Daniel gives us in outline, the Apocalypse gives us in detail, that the nations of the earth, the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication with this papal system, will still live after. They will likewise feel the wrath of Almighty God until they have their power taken away and they have submitted 